Good afternoon. I'm Devin Westhill, the director of the Federalist Society's Regulatory Transparency Project. On behalf of the Society, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, where we'll release and receive commentary on a new report that examines the admissions practices at three elite U.S. colleges as they affect Asian American applicants. Everyone here at the National Press Club today, in addition to receiving a nice lunch, uh, has also received a paper copy of the report for their review. For our friends on the live stream, um, you can find the report, which was released this morning at both the Center for Equal Opportunity web website, CEOUSA.org, and the website of the Regulatory Transparency Project, regproject.org, regproject.org. While you're at the Reg Project uh, website, uh, I encourage you to explore the content produced by our 12 different working groups who critically examine the administrative state in many areas of cyber, uh, in many areas, um, including cybersecurity and data privacy, FDA and healthcare, uh, and even state and local regulation. You'll find on the regproject.org website scores of podcasts and short videos in our free lunch podcast and fourth branch video series, as well as nearly two dozen papers written written by the experts who volunteer for the, uh, for the project. You can track our progress and receive alerts when we release new content by subscribing on regproject.org to the RTP newsletter. Uh, you can also follow us on social media uh, at Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Mrs. Linda Chavez. Linda is founder and chairman of the Center for Equal Opportunity. She also writes a weekly syndicated column that appears in newspapers across the country and is a political uh, analyst for Fox News Channel. Linda has authored several books, including Out of the Barrio, Toward a New Politics of Hispanic Assimilation, and a memoir entitled An Unlikely Conservative, The Transformation of an Ex-Liberal. She was also the editor of the prize-winning quarterly journal American Educator, published by the American Federation of Teachers, where she also served as assistant to AFT President Al Shanker and assistant director of legislation. In 2001, or 2000, Linda uh, was honored by the Library of Congress as a living legend uh, for her contributions to America's cultural and historical legacy. Linda has held a number of appointed positions, among them Chairman, National Commission on Migrant Education, White House Director of Public Liaison, Staff Director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and a member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Linda was the Republican nominee for U.S. Senator from Maryland in 1986. In 1992, she was elected by the United Nations Human Rights Commission to serve a four-year term as U.S. expert to the U.N. Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. In January 2001, Linda was President George W. Bush's nominee for Secretary of Labor until she withdrew her name from consideration. Linda currently serves on the board of directors of ABM Industries, Inc., Pilgrim's Pride, and IDT Capital, a subsidiary of IDT Corporation, as well as on boards of several nonprofit organizations. Linda is also active in the Republican Party and chairs the Latino Alliance, a federally registered political action committee. Finally, I'm pleased to say that Linda serves as chairman of the RTP's Race and Sex Working Group on the Regulatory Transparency Project. If you'd like to learn more about Linda or the Race and Sex Working Group, please visit regproject.org. Would you please join me in welcoming Linda Chavez. Thank you very much, uh, Devin, for that very nice introduction, but I've got to at least correct at least one of the uh, uh, things that you mentioned about me, and that is I am no longer a commentator for Fox News Channel, um, but I do do CNN uh, and MSNBC quite regularly, so um, still doing television, but not Fox. Somehow I think I was told that my views on immigration confused Fox viewers because I'm a conservative who supports immigration reform. Uh, it is a delight to be here today and to welcome you all on behalf of uh, the Re Regulatory Project, but also on behalf of the Center for Equal Opportunity, which I founded in 1995 and have chaired ever since. Uh, we have at, the C at CEO been involved over the years in a number of studies of the issue of racial preference in college and university admissions, both at the undergraduate and at the graduate and professional level. And the study that is being presented today, the paper being presented today, uh, is uh, the first time we've actually looked at this issue with respect to private schools as opposed to public education. 
But as somebody who has spent um, a, a professional lifetime working on issues of immigration, this particular study has a great deal of significance to me. Asian Americans have faced a long history of discrimination in the United States, going back uh, to their arrival on these shores in the mid-19th century, where Chinese workers primarily were brought to help build railroads, to work in the agricultural fields, to work uh, in a variety of jobs uh, throughout the continental United States, but primarily on the West Coast. Uh, from their advent on these shores, uh, Asian Americans uh, fought the barriers that were put, put up to prevent them uh, from succeeding in this society. They were barred from certain professions. They had to hold special licenses uh, in order to conduct businesses. Uh, in some instances, they were denied the right to own property. They were denied the right to marry. Uh, those of their choosing. Uh, the population was almost exclusively male uh, because women uh, were not uh, brought uh, here to work in, in those large numbers. And um, they were um, essentially um, barred from the United States in what was the very first of the broad restrictions against immigration uh, passed in the late 19th century, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred uh, the entry of people uh, from China, uh, but also placed other kinds of restrictions requiring those Chinese who were legally present in the United States to begin to carry identification papers. They were uh, prevented uh, it, by law from being able to leave the United States and to return. And uh, even their children uh, in later years, late in the 19th century, children born here in the United States and by virtue of the 14th Amendment uh, granted uh, the uh, right of citizenship by birth, even their children uh, were uh, attempted uh, to be barred from the United States, leading to uh, a famous court decision in 1998, which finally recognized that children born in the United States were, by virtue of the 14th Amendment, citizens of the United States and the state in which they resided. And these laws did not disappear. They were expanded so that what began as the Chinese Exclusion Act was later broadened to the Asiatic Bard Zone so that immigrants uh, from other parts of Asia were prevented from coming to the United States. These laws only began to be turned back with the advent of World War II when uh, the United States with uh, American troops fighting in the Philippines against the Japanese uh, were uh, embarrassed that uh, Filipinos could not uh, come to the United States. And so there began to be some lifting of these restrictions so that in 1952, uh, naturalization became possible uh, for those um, Asian Americans uh, who were here uh, legally and wanted to naturalize. And by 1965, uh, race was removed as a criteria for admission to the United States. I think I, I state all of this because I think it's important uh, in view of this study. Uh, this study is looking not at governmental action uh, per se, but by the at the behavior of elite institutions that are often uh, the door into uh, the most prominent positions in our society. So I'm very pleased that Althea Nagai, who's done work for us for many, many years looking at discrimination on the basis of race in college admissions, uh, is the author of this study. And I'm going to introduce the entire uh, group of panelists. We will have Althea presenting her paper, and then we will have several respondents, some of whom um, will elaborate or uh, be on basically the same page as Althea in terms of the findings, and some of whom uh, will not. Uh, first, I'd like to, uh, in addition to Althea Nagai, who is a research fellow at the Center for Equal Opportunity and is the author, as I mentioned, of CEO's st uh, Statistical Studies of Racial and Ethnic Preferences. Uh, she's also an independent statistical consultant working in DC. And if you would w remain at your table and then come up after I've introduced all of you. 
Uh, in addition to Althea, Terry Eastland, who is a senior fellow at CEO, is an accomplished journalist. He was editor of the Virginia Pilot in Norfolk, and he worked in the Reagan administration as a speechwriter, first for Attorney General William French Smith and as director of public affairs for Attorney General Edwin Meese. Uh, following uh, Terry, we have Yu Kong Zhao. Mr. Zhao is a distinguished Chinese American civil rights activist. He's president of the Asian American Coalition for Education, and he's the author of the book, The Chinese Secrets for Success, Five Inspiring Confucian Values. In May of 2015, Mr. Zhao and other Asian American leaders united 64 Asian American organizations and filed a civil rights complaint against Harvard U University. In addition uh, to those two panelists, we have Stuart Taylor, who's an author and freelance journalist focusing on legal policy and political issues. He's a contributing editor for National Journal, Journal and a former non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Stewart has covered the Supreme Court and other legal matters for the New York Times, Newsweek, and other publication, and has appeared frequently on all major television and radio programs. Uh, then we have um, someone who will present, I'm assuming, a somewhat counter view. She is Brenda Shum. Uh, she's director of the Educational Opportunities Project at the Lawyers for Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, where she oversees complex litigation, public policy, advocacy, and programs designed to ensure educational equity for all students and to eliminate discriminatory practices in schools. If you would all join me in welcoming the panel. And I would suggest, Althea, that you present from up here and that everyone else um, stay at their seats. Thank you. Oh, and turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. Okay. Asian immigration immigrants and their descendants have been a part of America for a long, long time, as Linda has recounted. Because of restricted immigration laws, Asian American population was very small and limited basically to the West Coast. Until around 1960, it hovered around two tenths of 1%. And a large portion of that was in Hawaii. After immigration reform, the population grew exponentially. In 1960, the Asian American population was roughly 980,000. By 2010, that number increased more than tenfold to over 17 million. It now makes up more than 4% of the U.S. population. With that increasing rise in Asian immigration and their descendants, has come a similar rise in Asian American college enrollment. In 1960, there were about 16,000 Asian Americans in college, rose to about 250,000 in 1980. Since then, it's more than quadrupled. Now there are about 1.2 million Asian Americans in college, both immigrants and their descendants. Given these developments, one could expect a steep rise in the number of Asian Americans applying to and enrolling in America's elite colleges and universities. This has happened, but not as much as in certain colleges and universities. After a steep rise in enrollment in the earlier years, around 1990, the number at some places had dropped off and has remained at this consistent lower level. Okay, in this context, we have this rise in population. We have this rise in college enrollment, but at some universities, it went down and it just kind of stayed at this level. So, in order to examine this and present a case study, I looked at three universities, all private, very elite universities. The first one is California Institute of Technology. 
I also look at MIT, and I look at Harvard. Now, California Institute of Technology, Caltech. It, like the other two, are in the top 10 right now of the US, you know, US News and World Report national rankings. Caltech has no racial preferences. So the number of Asian American undergraduates has increased quite steeply since about 2000. They make up more than 40% of Caltech today. This is very similar to what's happened at Berkeley, and this is very similar to what's happened at UCLA. Now, MIT is the contrasting case. MIT uses race and ethnicity as a factor when considering admissions. So, for the first couple of decades, the MIT pattern is very similar to Caltech. There's a sharp rise in the number of Asian Americans attending MIT. Hmm. And then it just kind of sits there at constant about 25, 26% from about the 1990s and most recently. It peaked at 29% at in 1990s, and then now it's around 26%. Okay, that's a 15-point gap compared to Caltech. <coughs> Harvard uses race, legacy, celebrity, donor considerations, and political prominence, all these other factors besides just academic qualifications. Now at Harvard, Asian American undergraduate enrollment increased sharply, as it did Caltech and MIT, until the 1990s. 21% was its height. It then significantly dropped since then and kind of stayed at that level of about 17% till now. This is the whole undergraduate class. Now, the gap, therefore, between Caltech and Harvard today is roughly 25%. This is trend data. One can infer discrimination from this trend data, but we don't have the big data for all the applications. We don't know what percentage of Asian Americans applied versus blacks, Hispanics, and whites. There's one study I know most recently that came out that does look at all applicants. This data is from the well-published, this is the data from which there's well-publicized findings about the disadvantage faced, facing Asian Americans. The study was done by Espen Shade and Radford in 2009. Asian Americans applying to elite private schools, they found, needed significantly higher SAT scores to it be admitted. 140%, 140 points more compared to whites, 270 more points compared to Hispanics, 40, 450 more points compared to African Americans. Now, what this means is basically, if you look at um, Asian Americans with SAT, you look at all applicants with SATs over 1,400, at the elite private schools, um, they admit 77% of blacks, 48% of Hispanics, 40% of whites, but only 30% of Asian Americans. It's not that these schools have an explicit rule saying, oh, we're only going to take, let's say, 25% of Asians. They don't have an explicit cap. What they use is this method called holistic admissions that was part of the Harvard plan. And the Harvard plan was you know, started in the 1920s. Ironically, the Harvard plan was used to bring in these non-academic factors like extracurricular activities, letters of recommendation, interviews. Um, they brought in all these factors in the 1920s to reduce the number of Jewish students at Harvard. Harvard never explicitly had a quota on Jews. They didn't say, oh, we're only going to get 15%. But what happened was once Harvard instituted all these non-academic factors, the percentage of Jewish students at Harvard dropped from over 25% to about 15 and remained there from about the mid-20s till after World War II. We're finding the same pattern among Asian Americans. It's under this vague thing called holistic admissions, and I think this is the source of a lot of ways in which discrimination actually occurs without explicitly needing a quota. But the, constant, the constancy of the number of Asians in the cohort at these elite schools 
Combined with the fact that the percentage applying to college keeps growing and growing and growing, I think leads to the conclusion that they are, they are probably discriminating against Asian Americans for, in other words, but for their race, these Asian Americans would probably have gotten into these colleges of their choice. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Terry. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Devin, for your work with this. And Althea, thank you for your, your paper. Very interesting. I hope you can hear me. My voice is, tends to be a little soft, so I'll try to exert it a little bit more. Uh, we're going to look at <clears throat> this topic uh, narrowly, if you will, in terms of the three schools that Althea looked at. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the three schools that she looked at, as well as the larger picture that we have out there. And I think the best way to think about the larger picture, and I'll start with that, uh, is in terms of something that Justice O'Connor wrote in her majority opinion for the court in 1980, in, excuse me, 2003. And that, of course, is the Grutter case. And after upholding the race preferential plan used by the, by the Michigan Law School, she went on to say this at the end, the requirement that all race-conscious admissions programs have a termination point assures all citizens that the deviation from the norm of equal treatment of all racial and ethnic groups is a temporary matter, a measure taken in the service of the goal of equality itself. She went on to say, we take the law school at its word that it would like nothing better than to find a race-neutral admissions formula and will terminate its race-conscious admissions program as soon as practicable. <clears throat> then she went on, and some of you may know this opinion well, she went on at this point to say that it has been 25 years since Justice Powell first approved the use of race to further an interest in student body diversity. <clears throat> in the context of public higher education. And that, of course, was the Bakke case in 1978. She went on to say, I agree with the court's holding that racial discrimination in higher education admissions will be illegal in 25 years. But I respectfully dissent from the remainder of the court's opinion and the judgment because I believe that the law school's current use of race, excuse me, I'm. I've got into a different paragraph. Uh, I'll start back. It has been 25 years since Justice Powell first approved the use of race in the Bakke case to further an interest in student body diversity in the context of public higher education. Since that time, the number of minority applicants with high grades and test scores has indeed increased. We expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interest of proof today. Well, that rather famous couple of paragraphs um, uh, bespoke uh, an expectation that something would happen, and that would be in what year, 2028? And so the question that I think that we can ask ourselves reasonably is this, what do we think will happen by 2028? Will race-conscious programs continue? And if so, why so? What will be the rationale that will govern them? And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's worth setting these two paragraphs out there because we have a better sense, I think, of what the larger stakes over time might be. As for me, um, uh, I'm still noodling on this, so I don't have an answer. But we may get an answer in the litigation that comes out of, that, that, that involves Harvard and I'm just going to say a word or two about that because I know other panelists want to discuss it. Um, and, and the Harvard case uh, is a case in which the students uh, for fair admissions have filed a lawsuit. It looks as though it may, it's in discovery, it looks as though it may be tried even by the end of the year, but if not, it'll be next year. Uh, and the charge, basically the allegation of the students who are suing Harvard is that they have to meet standards that are higher than everyone else's and that they're racial in character. Um, we'll, we will see 
certain arguments that are important here to, to, to highlight. Uh, one is that the court will again be, be, uh, be asked to review the application of certain legal doctrines that have eventuated ultimately in, in approval uh, of, of race conscious admissions, both in the Bakke case and in Gratz, excuse me, in the Gruder case. Uh, but diversity will be examined, as will the notion of critical mass. Uh, a critical mass being a, a certain number, perhaps, but although we can't specify which number is necessary uh, in terms of putting forth an affirmative action plan. Uh, I expect also that there will be discussions uh, in the court. Um, thank you. Uh, going to uh, non-racial means of trying to create uh, better opportunities for people of all uh, races and ethnicities in these socioeconomic means programs uh, we will see uh, discussed, as I say. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Zhao. Uh, thank you, Linda. On behalf of Asian American Coalition for uh, Education, hundreds of all supporting organizations and millions of Asian American pa parents who care dearly about their children's education. I applaud the research done by Dr. Nagay of the Center for Equal Education Opportunity. Asian American communities need more research like this to join the course has, which has been started by Daniel Gordon, by S, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Aspen Shed, by Richard Sanders, and by many, many more, uh, I think, uh, uh, professional uh, researchers. And I think uh, what this makes this research very important is looking to admission data of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Why? Because when America suffer from short of talents in STEM education, and actually Asian American children deliver. We dominate all the science and technology related competitions and it's all the like Olymp Olympic team, US national team, probably 70, 80% are Asian kids. And uh, like Caltech, pretty much admitted all children proportionally based, uh, you know, correlates with the population growth, but MIT failed to do that as a hidden de facto code on that. So this is very important. And uh, also this research correlates many you know, evidence, in particular after we file complaint of, of, uh, against Harvard, many former admission officers, the, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, students were discriminated against students. I just want to give one couple example. In 2016, inside higher education, that, that research says, the 39 percentage of admission officers from the public schools and 42 percent of them from private schools admitted they use a higher standard against Asian American children. That's a very uh, compelling uh, data point. We, I can list a lot. And uh, also like one other example, in South Florida two years ago, top four students are Asian, none of them get uh, into the Ivy League schools, Stanford top schools, but the next five of different racial group all admitted into Ivy League schools or other top universities. So I just give two compelling example, but I want to say, you know, Ivy League schools, actually beyond Ivy League schools, 42 states still use, college in 42 states still, still use risk fact in college admission, they illegally use de facto ratio quotas, higher standards, and racial stereotype unduly harm Asian American children. This is already banned by the relevant Supreme Court ruling 1978 and 2003. We have a lot of data. Uh, we have like, a, like rulings, uh, 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 Basically, the ruling specifically banned that, but they still do that. That's illegal, but I want to mention more importantly, is immoral. Linda mentioned 
about 136 years ago, Chinese Exclusion Act, the first race-based uh, policy in the US, you know, discriminate against Asian. Today, we still suffer the same thing. That's number one. Number two, I already told, Asian American parents and Asian American children fill out a huge gap. Country needs STEM ed ed talents. Suppose elite university should welcome our children, but they reject our children. That's number two. Number three, Asian American children is regarded as the highest income, best educated racial group in America, model minority. However, all children, in order to pursue their American dream, they have to hide their racial identity. That's immoral. Number, uh, 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 number four, the higher standard, the racial quotas really squeeze our children. Think about that. All children have to score 140 points uh, then white, 270, then Hispanic, and 450, then blacks, out of 1,600. How much time our children can spend on? So there's a high percentage of uh, like, uh, uh, depression. Some high school got suicide, OK? Uh, some children. So in conclusion, this is totally immoral, not only illegal, also immo immoral. This need to be stopped. Uh, one more point I, I just forgot. Asian American never set up the college admission policies. We never ask for any favor. But why some people claim we're overly represented? We're overly represented because we hard work, we tr cherish American principle, which is equal opportunity, hard work. So, but uh, what? Uh, Finally, what this report give us, like, uh, you know, tell us, we just should not stop at the research. We need to drive meaningful policy changes. And uh, like Terry said, we should channel our college admission, number one, to address K-12 education in inner cities, poor families, help, help them, bring them up, not, you know, not put limits on our children, that's number one. Number two, we should restore the merit based for college admission. Number three, we should also give a reasonable, pre a reasonable preference based on socioeconomic to help children who cannot afford to buy textbook, buy iPad, okay? So I think we need to have sound policy. But the one very important thing is, currently I applaud Department of Education, uh, Department of Justice already investigate of uh, Harvard in supporting our case. That, that's great. But uh, I think uh, the administration can do more. One example, in 2011, Obama administration issued a, a, a policy regarding college admission. In that policy, it is fair to ask colleges to really to implement like uh, the Supreme Court ruling, ban the racial quota, the high standard racial stereotype. It promote the racial balancing. So this need to be changed. This need to be stopped. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now Stuart. Hello. Thanks very much to Linda and to our sponsors for including me in this important discussion. And I'll begin by noting I deplore the pervasive discrimination in selective college admissions against Asian Americans that has been so well documented here. Uh, but I also believe that the most grievously damaged victims of the large racial preferences that predominate in our colleges today, selective colleges, are the supposed beneficiaries, especially African American students. And I'll go off on a bit of a tangent explaining why, and then I'll try to connect the dots by explaining why I think the best remedy for both forms of cruelty and discrimination is transparency. Um, I co-authored a 2012 book with uh, Richard Sander, who you mentioned. Uh, it's titled Mismatch, How Affirmative Action Hurts Students It's Intended to Help and Why Universities Won't Admit It. Uh, my co-author, Rick Sander, 
uh, is one of the leading um, scholars on this, on this issue. Uh, now, the arguments why racial preferences are unfair to many whites, and especially, as we now know, Asians, have been well made by more than, for more than 40 years by uh, a lot of uh, terrific people, including Terry, including Linda, including Roger Clegg, including some others in this room. And all the while, as Terry indicated, the use of racial preferences and their political entrenchment in elite circles has increased. Uh, the arguments have fallen on deaf ears in a lot of areas. The major engine of mismatch is not the fact that racial preferences are used by almost all selective colleges and universities in the United States, although that's important, but the major engine of mismatch is that the size of the gaps in academic preparation and ability between most entering students and the racially preferred groups and their Asian, especially Asian and white classmates are enormous as the numbers detailed by Althea demonstrate. A 450 point gap between two racial groups out of 1600, and by the way, you get 200, 400 points for showing up. Um, it's stunning. High school grades adjusted by the quality of the high school tell a similar story to the one told by SAT and ACT scores. A foreseeable but widely suppressed result is that these students tend to be unprepared for and shocked by the academic challenges they encounter once arrived at college. And it's not their fault. Nobody told them that they were starting a little bit behind the eight ball before they got there. And, uh, and struggle as they might, try as hard as they might, it's not easy to make up 450 SAT point, points when you're taking the same math class, let's say, uh, with the guy who had 450 more points. They're set up to fail by being brought without warning into highly competitive settings where they're likely to struggle academically, become demoralized, and bomb out of the academically challenging courses that are gateways to some of the most desirable professions. They also tend to become, of course, not all of them. Barack Obama did fine at Harvard Law School. I'm talking in generalities. Uh, they also tend to become isolated and alienated from more successful students who tend to socialize with other successful students. Social science research has demonstrated this. And they fail or barely squeak by, sometimes with consequences, including a lasting loss of intellectual self-confidence. That's been documented by scholars with statistical surveys and other means. These students are versions of victims, I'm sorry, of academic mismatch. They would do much better academically, most of them, and perhaps in their careers, and perhaps lead happier lives, although I'm getting a little bit afield from uh, scientifically uh, provable propositions, if they attended less selective but still competitive schools for which they are well prepared. Mismatch theory rests on a foundation of facts that are undisputed among serious experts, although hidden from view by academia, by the news media, by the government. These include the SAT gaps we, we've mentioned. Mismatch theory is also winning more acceptance in scholarly and other circles. An outpouring of empirical evidence shows that the consequences of huge racial gaps in academic preparation are what common sense would lead us to suspect, expect. Black students, and to a lesser extent Hispanics, cluster toward the bottoms of their classes. Most who aspire to major in science, pre-med, or engineering flee to softer courses, abandoning their career hopes in many cases. Most black students lack academic self-confidence, according to scholarly surveys. Black law graduates flunk the bar exam at four times the right, white rate. And the data, uh, especially my colleague Rick Sanders' data, uh, shows that the reason for this huge disparity in the bar flunk rates uh, is, is mainly the racial preference regime that funnels black students into law schools for which they are not well qualified and they actually learn less when they're falling behind the rest of the class than they would in a class in a class where they were competitive. As a result, we may have fewer black and Hispanic lawyers, doctors, scientists, engineers, and professors than we would if admissions were race neutral. More generally, large racial preferences place the best minority science students in schools where they are least likely to achieve their goals. Then there's the pervasive dishonesty at the heart of the racial preference regime, which begins with denial of all the points that I've been making. Highly selective schools systematically deceive, not to say defraud, 
their affirmative action recruits by telling them they are well qualified while failing to disclose the risks they run. Um, and so why do I say that the best remedy for these things is, is transparency? We've seen efforts to get court orders, and I'm not sure if we got court orders that said no more racial preferences, they would have much impact. Uh, it's become so embedded in the system uh, that uh, I'm not sure that would do it. But if everybody knew, every student applying to any selective college knew in advance how well do I stack up in terms of preparation against my classmates? Uh, and if every Asian American student who is being discriminated against had the numbers to prove it conclusively, it's been proven pretty well here, then I think you'd see a healthy trend towards uh, everybody, not everybody, but people from all of these groups turning away from uh, large racial preferences towards other means of ensuring diversity, and there are plenty of others. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Shum. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank the um, Center for Education, Center for Equal Opportunity and Linda and um, the organizers of this event for inviting me to join this important conversation. I suspect that I have colleagues and friends who would, have, who would probably view my decision to um, participate in this panel, on this panel, as um, venturing into the belly of the beast. And I would hope that you view my participation here today as uh, a sign of my commitment to rigor and authentic dialogue um, about some very important and complex issues. I think that um, I really very much appreciate uh, Dr. Nagai's interest and commitment to trying to understand the effect of holistic or race conscious admission policies on Asian American students, um, even as I reject its ultimate findings and the assumptions um, that are embedded in the report, as well as the um, either intended or unintended consequences of increased racial anxiety that the report is likely to produce. Before I respond directly to the findings of the report, I do think it's worth um, thinking about the legal landscape against which um, these questions related to race conscious admissions and discrimination in higher education are taking place. If we reflect for a minute on the origin story of affirmative action, I think that we recognize that as a policy, it was a, um, an attempt to, to really address and recognize the fact that intentional discrimination against racial minorities, including Asians, um, became embedded over time in some of the structures of society, including our institutions of higher education. And today, if you, um, if you enter into a conversation with uh, the general public, I think that many people conflate and equate affirmative action to um, affirmative action in higher education, admissions, even though it began as uh, a policy that was really intended to address some of the lingering effects of structural and systemic discrimination in employment and hiring and business contracts. And while the intended beneficiaries were initially African Americans, I do think it's important to reiterate, as Linda did, that Asians have been subjected to um, historical discrimination and um, also suffer from um, many of the same long-term impacts um, and, co and consequences of, uh, the, of these types of structural um, disadvantages. So I think that, uh, you know, over time, it is clear that our courts have struggled to really understand the role that race can and should be playing in educational and employment opportunities. And the arc of cases from Bakke to Fisher II make it clear that um, the pursuit of educational, of the educational benefits of diversity, including racial diversity, is in fact a compelling state interest that is entitled to um, constitutional protection. And 
as a starting point, I think that it is important to reiterate that the Harvard holistic admission policies and plan um, that it is currently using is not, uh, does not use racial quotas. It does not involve points that are adam automatically assigned to any um, given racial group. And race is only one of many diversity factors that the institution is considering when it is deciding um, which students to make an offer of admission to. As we, I, I think that, um, you know, Fisher 1 was decided, I believe, in 2014. We had Fisher 2 in 2016. And those two cases together, I think, were um, the court's most um, important opportunity to really look at the complex uh, um, system involved in making offers of admission to our institutions of higher education, as well as trying to articulate and understand um, the strict scrutiny that courts should be applying when they are analyzing um, the justifications that uh, colleges and universities are using in order to make their admission decisions. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights does represent a group of underrepresented minority students, including Asian and uh, Southeast Asian um, students and applicants to uh, Harvard University in the Harvard uh, litigation that was previously mentioned. We also represent um, underrepresented minority students and applicants at the University of North Carolina in the parallel case that was filed by um, the Students for Fair Admission. Um, the Harvard litigation is in fact currently in discovery and is scheduled to go to trial in October of um, this year if, if there are no further delays. So I think that um, Obviously, uh, it, it is a very, the, the conversation that we're having today um, is both timely and significant in terms of um, what it offers in, in, as a window, in a way, to how we think about uh, race and um, society. And there are just a couple of points that I would like to make in response to the report that um, is being released today. The first is that this so-called Asian penalty in admissions is not caused by affirmative action policies. I understand that this uh, study by Espen Shad and Espen Shade and Radford um, is said to determine that Asian American applicants need to score higher on standardized, te standardized tests in order to gain admission into our country's most selective colleges. But in reality, any test score gap between Asians and other students is not related um, to affirmative action because this, this, the same test score gaps exist whether a university is considering race in its, in its admission policy or not. And in 2009, I believe, and again in 2016, Espen Shade was interviewed and was reported um, to say that his study does not stand for the proposition that Asian Americans are subjected to illegal racial discrimination in college admissions. In fact, there is another study that the supposed Asian penalty that is being discussed today is actually due to white admissions advantage and not affirmative action. Because the underrepresented minorities that actually stand to benefit from affirmative action comprise such a small proportion of the actual applicant pool to some of our elite universities, both public and private. A 2016 study found that completely eliminating African American and Latino applicants from the Harvard admission pool would only increase the admission chances of Asian American students by 1%, which actually demonstrates that African American and Latino applicants are not taking Asian American um, seats in uh, the admitted classes. Another point that I would like to make um, this afternoon 
is that Asian Americans actually benefit from affirmative action. Although it was, as I mentioned before, largely created to remedy past discrimination against African Americans, affirmative action does open doors um, for many Asian Americans in education, employment, and contracting. And I think that one of the reasons this conversation is so complex is that this um, uh, is that Asian Americans are not a monolith, that it's really important to understand that there are a number of racial and ethnic groups that are often reduced to this tag of Asian American. After California eliminated affirmative action in its public universities, Asian American students were less likely to get into the UC system than under affirmative action. Um, and certain underrepresented subgroups, such as Filipino Americans, were being shut out of the most selective California institutions. And so today, I think it's important to um, reiterate that there are many Asian American subgroups of students that continue to um, benefit from um, race conscious admission policies. And then finally, affirmative action um, is uh, said to divide the Asian American community. And this fear um, is actually overstated. Contrary to a lot of the mainstream coverage of Asian American opposition to affirmative action, public opinion polls consistently show that a majority of Asian Americans support aff affirmative action. More than 160 Asian American and Pacific Islander groups signed on to an amicus brief that supported affirmative action in the Fisher case, and um, it's important to include and amplify all of the diverse voices in um, the Asian American community when we are talking about affirmative action and holistic um, admission policies. I think that um, what underlies a lot of the misperception about affirmative action and holistic admission policies is this idea that there is an objective um, formula for college admissions. And I think that this leads um, many applicants and students to believe that that um, there should be similar acceptance rates for um, our elite institutions. But I think if you look at a school like Caltech or MIT um, and you compare it to an institution like Yale or Harvard, um, I think anybody would recognize that our science and engineering schools may in fact have very different um, qualities in candidates and applicants that, that they're looking for than a more liberal arts institution or college such as Yale and um, Stanford or, um, or Harvard. So the idea that the same outstanding applicant um, for Caltech would be the same outstanding applicant to an institution like Harvard is, um, is not accurate. I also think that there is this um, misperception that test scores are um, the most, uh, most uh, um, accurate and objective measure of merit, and this is um, not true. And um, holistic review includes but uh, does, is not limited to standardized test scores and grades and actually takes much um, a much more complex and nuanced look at all of the different things that um, a student may bring to the educational community, learning community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back up and you can take my chair in case there are some questions for you. <laughs> I'm hoping they're going to be actual questions for the author. But thank you all very much. I think this was an excellent panel. Let's give everybody a round of applause. So I'm going to open it up to questions. I would just ask that you state your name and if you have any affiliation to state that. And if you have a particular member of the panel or our author and you want to address your question to that person, uh, let me know. How about if we just let's go into questions and you can work your comments in? I'm sure we could we could all we could we could turn this into a debate, but that's not the point. Roger Clegg. Uh, I'm Roger Clegg. I'm with the Center for Equal Opportunity. Would you please 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 yeah. Please. I'm Roger Clegg with the uh, Center for Equal Opportunity, and I had a question. Uh, I guess it's for all the panelists, but particularly for uh, uh, Ms. Shum. 
Uh, and that is that with respect to the diversity justification which is used, um, if it is shown that Harvard discriminates uh, against Asian American applicants vis-a-vis -vis whites, um, is there any uh, use that can be made of the diversity justification since uh, whites are still a plurality of the students uh, who are admitted to Harvard. And so if um, more white students and fewer Asian American students are being admitted because of uh, Harvard's policies, this would suggest that there's, this would suggest that there's actually less uh, diversity uh, because of the discrimination. First of all, um, excuse me. Um, so first of all, uh, once again, the Harvard admission plan and policy does not discriminate against Asian Americans on behalf of either white students or any other um, applicant. And in terms of the diversity justification, um, ra race is just one of many factors that is used in making a decision about um, which students to admit. I think this desire to look at numbers, um, it, it can be informative, but it is not um, the sole indicator of whether an institution has actually achieved the educational benefits of diversity. I think that um, I'm not a, a, a viewer of um, Top Chef, but there is one of those shows that uh, gives every uh, contestant a, a box of ingredients and asks them to make uh, something uh, very spectacular and tasty out of it. And I think that um, there is no recipe or formula for what um, ingredients a, an institution um, is uh, allowed to draw upon in terms of um, putting together um, its own special sauce in terms of educational diversity. Um, and I think that um, while the numbers and the data that Dr. Nagai refers to in her report is, um, I think, informative in terms of understanding um, perhaps the interplay between between holistic admission policies at our elite institutions and um, the percentage of Asian applicants. It's also important to, to note that um, the, I, I believe that in the class of 2021 at Harvard, um, approximately 21% of the total applicant pool um, consists of Asian American students and 20, approximately 21 or 22% of admitted students um, are Asian students. So I think that that is actually also informative. Yes. I'll get the microphone. Great. Bonnie Wachtel, I'm just an interested observer. So I'm sorry to say I'm going to address this question to the same panelist at the end of the, at the, end of the line there. So we, I understand everything that you've said, and I think we all who are interested in affirmative action have heard this many times, the argument there's no quota, holistic, all of that. Except, and you defended a lot against a lot of what the other panelists said, except you didn't say a word connecting to what Stuart Taylor brought to bear, which is this very detailed analytic effort that he has undertaken, along with Richard Sandard, to break that rhetorical uh, wall by pointing out real evidence of failure uh, for the beneficiaries of affirmative action, supposed beneficiaries of affirmative action. And although we're here talking about Asians, what I really understand you to be defending is the black and Latina, black and Latino uh, thinly veiled quotas at the bottom. So perhaps you could speak to uh, what you think about that evidence, and I underline that, and maybe, Stuart, you could mix back in if, uh, if you don't care for the response. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. I think that um, we wholly reject sort of the analysis that underlies the mismatch theory um, and the conclusions that imply that um, underprepared, uh, underqualified, um, and less capable minority students, including Asian American students, are, are only admitted to more competitive public and private institutions um, on the basis of affirmative action. I think that there is um, contrary evidence, if you care to look for it, that would demonstrate that um, those students are equally successful. And if you want, to, and that is probably more important to understand what uh, leads to and promotes 
towards student retention more broadly, not just the retention and success of our minority um, students on college campuses, but all students, in order to ensure that um, we have students who are able to complete their education um, in a successful way. And you know, I do have, I think, even personal experience with some of the um, some of the biases and assumptions that are embedded in that question. When I was a law student at the University of Washington, there was um, a very strong commitment to a diverse student class. This was a diversity policy that included, but was not limited to um, race. I attended law school with a number of students who were non-traditional um, professionals from other fields, students with disabilities, um, and the like. And I think, and you know, I had a male, uh, white male class. Um, essentially tell me that the only reason I had, been, uh, I had been admitted to the University of Washington Law School um, was affirmative action. And he was not saying this um, in an effort to, um, I think, uh, be critical of me personally, but to um, just invite a conversation about these very complex and difficult issues. And I would um, venture to say that um, I absolutely stand by my um, personal um, belief that my uh, admission to that institution was not um, solely a product of affirmative action and was actually reflective of um, my talent and my capacity in comparison to the other applicants that year. Stuart? Uh, I won't go on a great length because we're a little off to a tangent, but just a couple of points. One, nobody is ever admitted to any institution solely on the basis of race. It's a question of whether this one was admitted instead of that one, and many of these instead of many of those. I think the test score data and the grade data and the many other ways in which gaps have been documented in terms of entering qualifications of students at Harvard, MIT, many other places, um, speak for themselves, and, and it's not necessary to bela belabor them. Um, a couple of data points that come up in terms of performance. Uh, our data showed in our book, one half of law students, uh, black law students, most of whom are admitted based on affirmative action, uh, graduate in the bottom tenth of their class. Now that's not a happy place to be. Uh, one quarter or so of undergraduate uh, blacks graduate in the bottom tenth of their class. Again, not a happy place to be. We have, there are many, many, many uh, anecdotes that flesh out what the statistics show, which is uh, black students who we've interviewed uh, explaining how what a rude shock it was to them when they got to the place where they had been told they were going to do so well, and suddenly it was like hitting, getting hit by a truck. Uh, not many flunk out, or not, not, not that many, um, because hardly anybody flunks out, but there are a lot of disappointed, unhappy uh, black students who were kind of uh, mugged by the facts after, not before, they decided to go to Colgate or to Cornell or wherever. Um, there are a lot of scholars. Uh, Rick, Rick Sander was the pioneer, but there are now probably 20, maybe 30 scholarly studies, serious scholarly studies, uh, documenting the mismatch effect. I'm not going to try and summarize them now, but I think the evidence is very powerful. I would just uh, give a little plug here to CEOs' own studies. So we've done a series of uh, studies on colleges and universities, literally dozens of them, and professional schools. And particularly with respect to law school and six-year graduation uh, rates at uh, undergraduate schools and also medical schools, our studies do in fact show tremendous disparities in terms of achievement uh, by race among those students. And those are available on our website, CEO. CEOUSA.org. One more question. Uh, well, yes. Yes. Thank you, Linda. And I'm, I want to also address my question to Ms. Shum. Uh, Mike name Gonzalez. And, <coughs> name and <coughs> Mike affiliation. Gonzalez of the Heritage Foundation. <clears throat> First, I want to applaud you for, for coming here in the interest of rigorous and, and authentic debate. I think you've done a really good job. And I wanted to hear from you because I want you to challenge my views. I wanted to address two points about the, the diversity uh, rationale at the, heart of, at the heart of Baki. The first one is uh, that it assumes that people of minorities, quote unquote, will act according to the stereotype of the group. Otherwise, there is no benefit to, to the, there's, there's no diversity benefit uh, to education. Um, so if a, if, a, if a kid with a Hispanic surname 
goes to Harvard, he has to hold the, percent, the, the, the views of that group if there's going to be any diversity interest. Uh, and that it, in itself is a, a little bit, uh, you know, he's, so, so he's there to teach some, some white kid from Greenwich what Hispanics think. What if he doesn't want to think Hispanic? What if he just thinks mainstream? So, so, so that is one thing that I take great issue with. The second one is <clears throat> what it actually militates against immigration. If you're a pro-immigration like Ms. Chavez is, if you're a white parent and you know that diversity, diversity, the diversity benefit will, will inevitably mean proportionalism. So if I am a parent with, who, whose kid is gonna go to school in 18 years, why would I want any immigration at all if diversity leads to group proportionalism and my kid is going to be discriminated against? So I, I, I think that we, I think one of the reasons why, and I do hope this Boston case reaches the Supreme Court because it, there's no way that if it reaches the Supreme Court, even with Kennedy there, this will, this will persist. Uh, one more point, the, when you said about Althea's paper that is going to re lead to more racial anxiety, you have to go to the Board of Education meetings that my wife and I go to. The anxiety is there. I mean, this is standing room only. Chinese American parents are in a state of revolt, as you know. But I, but, but I wanna, I having said, made these critical remarks, you did a great job. And I really, I, I am interested in, in your point of view because I wanna challenge my views. Thank you. Thank you. And I actually um, feel like we are in fundamental agreement, especially about uh, the first point, which is that um, I don't think you can reduce uh, perspective to race. And so it is essential for us to think about diversity within diversity. And the flexibility of um, holistic race conscious admissions is that it allows institutions to look beyond um, an individual's race, uh, ethnic background, gender, um, socioeconomic background. There are institutions that um, consider up to 900 different diversity factors when they are making their admission decisions. And I think it's essential to give um, some credence to our admission officers who are not conflating race with a certain perspective. You are not um, uh, a spokesperson for your race simply because you um, are uh, a student who is African American or a student who is Asian American. Again, I think that it's important to really think about the different, um, not just racial subjects, groups, but the different perspectives that all aspects of our life experience um, contribute to our um, personality and our worldview. And then in terms of your second point, again, I would reject this idea that um, or race conscious or, or holistic admissions um, is uh, contributing to proportionality or uh, should um, in fact kind of the debate the debate around immigration um, due to some of the fears that opportunity is going to be allocated on some percentage basis. I think that what um, Dr. Nagai's report does do is make an observation that if you look at the data, then you can certainly um, make some, some um, observations about the percentage of um, the, or the just general demographics of uh, students who are being admitted to our elite institutions. However, it does not allow you to draw the conclusion that race conscious admissions are the cause of um, the, what, is, what is happening in terms of both the applicant pool and enrollment. Because once again, I think that um, if you take a look, the, many um, very exceptional, highly qualified valedictorian students who have phenomenal um, extracurricular activities and great grade point averages are rejected from our elite institutions every year. Um, if you take a look at the percentage of the applicants um, to Harvard institutions, to Harvard College, excuse me, um, who are Asian American and the percentage of those who are actually admitted and offered uh, an admission um, spot for the year, the, the graduating class of 2021, they're roughly the same. And so this idea that you have a, a ton of uh, um, more um, Asian American applicants and a narrowing of those who are being um, allowed into the institution because of proportionality is simply not correct. Um, and again, I do think that uh, I appreciate you sort of um, attempting to link this conversation to the broader conversation that we should all be having about um, whether race still matters in today's society. And I appreciate the desire to believe that we live in a race-blind 
in a race blind society. And I assure you that that is not accurate. I don't think, uh, I think that if we're talking about higher education, you can take a look at what is happening in terms of the debates and conversations at our college campuses across the country. Um, and you would be forced to recognize that um, many of these um, uh, discourses relate to um, understanding not just the fact that race matters, but how it should matter. Let me give one minute uh, to Mr. Zhao, who's been very anxious to <laughs> respond. So, but just one minute. Okay. We're running yeah. out of time. Uh, basically, uh, I want to respond to Brendan's some claim. She said the majority of Asian Americans support affirmative action, but that is false. Uh, false. Why? Because the question was asked like this: Do you support affirmative action that bring uh, education, career benefit to um, minorities, black, uh, Hispanic, and uh, like uh, Asians? So. Two thirds of them answer yes. However, in a Gallup's poll, which make it very specific, say, do you support a merit-based college admission versus like race-based? Two thirds of American population said no. Fifty percentage of African Americans said no. So that's the first point. Second point, I want to make very clear: there's wide abuse of affirmative action in the like college admission. I had a meeting, a panel discussion with the director of the admission office association. He was asked a question, what a risk fact. He says, you know, your GPA, your test scores, other, and also your actual curricula is something qualify you to be considered. Risk plays a major role. And I immediately point out that's the reason why widespread discrimination against Asian children, because there's no policy guide. They are not properly trained. So that's the reason before Harvard, before we filed a complaint and Harvard was sued into a 14, they kept the admission ratio of Asian American between 14 and 17% for 20 years. But after we filed a complaint and after they were sued, they jumped to immediately why they have to examine their policies. So that is the issue. That they abuse the firm action and the firm action originally have no risk preference. I want to point out. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I would like just to, to say a couple of words about an issue that was not raised, but was raised in the paper, and that was the question of legacy admissions. And I found, uh, for those of you who have not yet had a chance to read the paper, uh, it was very very interesting uh, that uh, some universities, Harvard, give such a heavy preference uh, towards legacy, whereas MIT did not, uh, and Caltech did not give a preference towards either race uh, or uh, legacies. And interestingly, when neither of those uh, were given preference, uh, then Asian American students uh, excelled in terms of their proportion of the students uh, admitted. I think this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, as always, we try to have debate um, in these fora. We like to uh, ensure that we're not simply preaching to the choir, but that we allow alternative viewpoints. And so I want to give a special thanks to uh, Brenda Shum for being here and for representing a point of view uh, different from some of the other panelists. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. And I commend to you uh, the paper by Dr. Nagai and also the work that the Federalist Society is doing in our race and sex uh, project on uh, race and sex uh, regulations uh, and to the Center for Equal Opportunity as we fight for what we believe is uh, embedded in our constitution and will provide for a fairer society. And that is the ideal of a colorblind America. Thank you very much.